So now we came to the second uh, chapter, which is about functions and morphisms. So I've told you that um, somehow <coughs> it's uh, one always when one, I mean, usually in mathematics when one studies something, some spaces with a structure, then uh, uh, one of the things that one al always studies along with it is the maps between these spaces which are compatible with the structure. And so in our case, these are the morphisms. These will be maps between uh, affine or, I mean, quasi-projective or quasi-affine varieties, which um, are compatible with the fact that these are uh, varieties. And we have to make sense of this statement first, <coughs> I mean, to find out what we mean by that. And for that, we first study the, the maps from varieties to just the ground field K, which are compatible with the fact that uh, um, we are looking at varieties. And uh, so the first, we first look at a very special case and look at some very special functions, which are not as um, uh, general as we will want them later. Uh, you know, after all, algebraic varieties are something which, uh, you know, if, it's, if we are in an they are some zero sets of polynomials. And so everything is somehow about polynomials. So certain kinds of functions that we can study are just the polynomials. And so the functions on a, on a variety, on an affine variety, I mean, that we could study is just the restrictions of polynomials to that variety. That's certainly something we can look at. And this uh, we will first study. And this is the so-called coordinate ring. So, um, so first we look at uh, the coordinate ring of uh, n a fine algebraic set. So actually, for, we don't. Um, so, <clears throat> how's that? Um, so we have seen um, if x, so x is an F in a n, is an is an a fine algebraic set. So then we can consider the ideal of x. So the ideal of x is ix, which is, uh, as you recall, the set of all polynomials f in uh, kx1 to xn, such that, um, say, I could just say it like that, f restricted to x is equal to 0 for Last that. So on, for all points in X, uh, F will be zero. And the coordinate ring then, so the, uh, one often says the, the fine coordinate ring of X is just um, defined to be AX equal to all the polynomials divided by the ideal of x. So this is a ring. And um, so this is a ring. And, uh, you know, it is also, if you want, it is also a K algebra. So that just means it's a, a ring which contains K as a subring, because uh, <coughs> um, okay. So what can we say about it? The first thing is that we can also view it in a different way. 
we can say that this can be identified with just the set of all restrictions of polynomials to x. So elements here, there's a, you know, there's a ring isomorphism between this and the set of all restrictions of f to x. So, and these one could call polynomial functions. So definition. So we have x is still in a fine algebraic set. So a polynomial function on x is um, uh, a function of the form uh, f from x to k uh, such that f is equal to f restricted to x for f a polynomial. Okay, so just all the restrictions <coughs> and uh, <coughs> of uh, polynomials to x. And you, you see that these can be, you know, if you have you know, such uh, functions to k can always be added, multiplied, and so on by pointwise addition and multiplication. So this is a ring uh, with uh, pointwise addition and multiplication. So just, I mean, as usual, so that f of f plus g of p is equal to f of p plus g of p and f g of p is equal to f of p times g of p for all p. So as always, and now what you obviously have, I mean, this is uh, clear, is we have a ring homomorphism. So, so there's a ring homomorphism Um, say from k x1 to xn to the set of polynomial functions on x. Which uh, just sends, obviously, a polynomial f to its restriction to x. And you know, you can see that by definition, this ring homomorphism is surjective. And by definition of the ideal of x, the ideal of x is precisely this, the kernel of this map. So thus, we get that we have a canonical isomorphism between. Uh, so thus, we have an isomorphism of links or k algebras, if one wants, um, that uh, Ax is isomorphic to. Uh, the polynomial functions on X. I mean, by the obvious map, the class of a function f modulo the ideal of X is sent to f restricted to X. So in future, we do not, you know, in some sense, obviously, these are the same things. So in future, we will not distinguish between them. So we will also write Ax for the polynomial functions on x. You know? So we can see that, <coughs> uh, therefore, this ring really parameterizes functions. So all possible functions from x to k, which are given as restrictions to polynomials. And we will write elements of Ax either like that or like that, depending on 
what uh, fits better into the argument. Okay, so this is this little statement. Um, And we can, I want to just for, do I need this? Yeah, for later usage, I want to make some tiny remark. Namely, <clears throat> um, so, is it? Um, so the, the zero set of a polynomial function is closed. So that means if, uh, so if x is in a fine algebraic set, f is an element in Ax, Then if I look at the zero set of F, so this is the set of all points P and X, such that F of P is equal to zero. F after all is a function on X, so we can say what F of P is, then this set is closed in X. Well, and actually that's uh, basically trivial because what does it mean? If f is in Ax, means uh, that uh, we can write f equal to f restricted to x for some polynomial f in kx1 to xn. And uh, what is this? Then z of f is by definition just a set of all points p and x such that large f of p is equal to zero, which is nothing else than x intersected the zero set of f. And so it's closed in x. Okay, so this was um, kind of uh, some kind of prelude about uh, before we really talk about the functions we want to study, we first look at a particular simple case of functions, which are just restrictions of polynomials. Um, now we want to uh, look at um, so We want to define something which are regular functions. We will define them both in the for affine uh, varieties and for uh, projective varieties. We'll only define them for varieties, so we will assume that uh, uh, our uh, Algebraic set is irreducible, so let's do it for uh, on affine varieties first. So these are the functions. These should be functions from our well, actually not affine varieties, so quasi affine varieties. So we have some open subset in an affine variety. We want to define what are the functions, so maps from this open subset to K, which are compatible with the structure of being a variety. Now, in some senses, everything is given by polynomials. One could think that this should be just, again, the restrictions of the polynomials to this quasi-fine variety. But if you think of it, um, you know, so if V subset X is a quasi fine variety, so that, you know, X in 
Again, is some sub variety. Um, then, if we look at, we could define something which I, uh, for the moment, call A of V, or maybe I just keep calling it A of V, which is um, the set of all. Uh, all restrictions, f restricted to v, where f is a polynomial in k x1 to xn. But so again, we have a map from uh, k x1 to xn to a of v. But what's the kernel? You know, we know that <clears throat> if you think of it, the ideal of V, so the set, you know, the kernel of, so we have a map again, kx1 to xn to A of V, you know, subjective by definition, just F maps to F restricted to V, and the kernel is I of V. But you know, I of V is all the functions which vanish on V. But if they vanish on V, they also vanish on the closure of V because the, the, the zero locus of a polynomial is closed. So this is the same as I of X. So we see that A of V actually is equal to A of X. So <clears throat> now we want that the functions that we consider somehow distinguish between the different spaces. So we see that this is not good if we just look at these, because we take an open subset and we don't, we get the same uh, functions as before. They are not more or not less. So therefore we want to define uh, it in a different way. Instead of taking polynomials, we take uh, rational functions, so quotients of polynomials, in such a way that there's no pole on V, so that they are no, everywhere are defined. Okay, so let's do that. So, so a regular function on V should be um, a rational function so a quotient of two polynomials which has no pole on V um, we have to see a bit more precisely what the correct definition is but anyway that's more or less what we want and so now let's try to make an actual definition out of it. Yeah? Why I V is equal to I X? So V is an open subset, so I didn't say it, but V is supposed to be an open subset in X. Okay? So the I of V is a set of all functions if of all polynomials which vanish on V. But if, a you know, the zero set of polynomial is closed. So if a polynomial vanishes on V, it also vanishes on the closure of V. And the closure of V is X. Okay. No? X is irreducible, so if I take an open subset of that, then, yeah? Okay. <laughs> so... So I, I will still keep this notation A of V, although it's equal to A of X when I find it useful, okay? If I don't want to specify what the closure of my quasi-defined varieties, I just write A of V for, for this thing. Okay. So we have defined, so, <clears throat> so but now I want to take a variety here. So V is irreducible. So X is irreducible and V is irreducible. And I want to do this because we know, so if um, 
uh, x is uh, quasi a fine variety or in the fine variety. Uh, then we have that the ideal of x is a prime ideal. In fact, it's equivalent you know, that we had said. Now, this is equivalent to saying that the quotient of uh, kx1 to xn by this, by this ideal is a an integral domain. So this is equivalent to the fact that a of x is an integral domain. And if we have an integral domain, we can form uh, the quotient field. So, and you know, we, the quotient field only of a ring only exists if it is in uh, an integral domain. So, that's why we restrict here attention to the case of varieties. There is, in fact, um, uh, a way to do everything that I do here directly for. Uh, a fine uh, or quasi fine algebraic sets by doing uh, localization in the correct way. But somehow I uh, kind of want to avoid that. But it's not particularly difficult, but I don't really need it. And so I, I, don't, do, I, I, I don't do the correct, the general fo form of localization. I just uh, look at uh, uh, integral domains in the quotient field and then the localization is of something is then always a subring of the quotient field. Anyway, so you don't have to understand these words. I just say them for who knows it. Um, now uh, I will go ahead. So, so we have, um, so we can look at this quotient field. So again, assume we have again v in x quasi fine variety. And then a v is equal to a x. So the quotient field I don't know, I cannot write anymore. Uh, Q of the x, well, which is the same as the quotient field of a v of um, say the x or a v is uh, the field of rational functions is called the field of rational functions on x and denoted um, Kx, or if I want, it's also the field of rational functions on V. And then I denote it Kv. Okay. And elements in this thing are called rational functions in V, on V. So an element is called a rational function on V. So we want to use rational functions to define regular functions. I mean, on open subsets. So, uh, <clears throat> so first we define the local ring at a point. So let P be a point in V. The local ring of P of V at P uh, is uh, the set, see, so I write it OVP, maybe a bit larger, which is um, the set 
what is it? So this should be all elements in this uh, quotient field which are in a suitable sense defined at P. So I can write like this. These are the sets of all H in KV such that uh, there exists F and G in AV such that H can be written as F divided by G. I mean, obviously, the, you remember that the quotient field is given by equivalence classes of, uh, of such pairs, and such an equivalence class is written as the quotient like that, uh, such that G of P is different from zero. So these are, <coughs> so, um, so what I mean by that, that obviously H can be written in many ways as a quotient of, of two functions. You can always multiply with any element on AV on both sides. And if you choose one, which is zero at P, if you multiply by some, you know, some L, where L of P is equal to zero, then you have FL divided by GL, which, uh, and then the statement is not fulfilled. But you have what is just said is that you, there is a way to write H as F divided by G, such that G of P is non-zero. There's one such choice. Okay, in the equivalence class, there is such an element. And as an abbreviation, so for, for simplicity, uh, in future, we write this and similar statements just, this is that we write this as a OVP is equal to the set of all F divided by G in KV such that uh, G of P is non-zero. So this is supposed to mean precisely this. Okay, just you, these are all elements in KV which can be written as F divided by G such as G of P is not, not zero. Not that for every way of writing it, this is the okay. case. Okay, so this is the local ring. And you could say, okay, no, maybe not. And then I say, so if U in V is an open subset, then uh, we put Uh, say OV of U. So the regular functions on U are OV U, which is the set of, uh, no, I can say it even more simpler, this is the intersection over all P and U of OVP. Okay. You know, this by definition is a subset of or a subring of well, whatever. This is a sub subset of uh, KV subring. <coughs> and uh, I just take the intersection over all of these in KV. I can certainly do that. So in other words, um, I could also say it like this, this is the set of all H in KV, such that for every P, there exists F and G, such that H can be written as, uh, for every P in U, there exists F and G, such that H can be written as F divided by G, such as G of P is non-zero. But it goes in that way, for every P, there exists F and G. It's not claimed that, uh, and it would be a different statement, that there exists F and G so that it works for every P. There's no reason to believe that that should be true. And it also isn't, usually. <clears throat> okay. So now, these are called regular functions. So if they are called regular functions, they should be functions. A function is a map from U to K. So you have to see why this thing, which by itself is just abstractly defined as a, you know, as a subring of KV, why this thing is actually a, a set of functions. So you have to see how 
you know, I use this thing to map. And in some sense, it's maybe obvious what you do if you have any, uh, any P here, you send uh, and you find such F and G at the P which do this, you send P to F of P divided by G of P. Okay, and so let's see whether that indeed works. <coughs> So, this is maybe the mark. So we have a map. Actually, a, a ring homomorphism. Um, from uh, OV of U. So uh, the functions uh, from u to k. No, the functions are always uh, to k are always a ring, but point was this multiplication. Just in the and how is the ring homomorphism given? So if uh, if we have an H in O V of U, we write uh, uh, so, and we take a point P in U, we write uh, H equal to F divided by G with G of P different from zero, and then we set H of P equal to F of P divided by G of P. Now, as F and G are already uh, elements in uh, AV, so they are functions on, on V, and so I can just do that. And G of P is non zero, so this makes sense. Um, so, um, so thus we, uh, this gives us a map like this. So we send H in O V of U is sent to something which we called also H from U to K. P is sent to H of P. You find like this. So um, we have to be careful because we have to see that this makes sense. So is this map well defined? So after all, an element here is an element in this, uh, in this quotient field. So it's a, an equivalence class of pairs. So it must not depend on the, uh, on the representative. So if, say, h is equal to f divided by g, and it's also equal to f prime divided by g prime, where uh, this g of p is different from 0 and also g prime of p is different from 0, well, then, you know, the equivalence relation is that f times g prime is equal to f prime times g. And so it follows, now we can put p into this. These are all well defined. So this is f of p, g prime of p is equal to f prime of p, g of p. And then, you know, then we can again divide. So, you know, now we are talking about numbers and we can look at the fraction of the numbers. So it follows that f of p divided by g of p is equal to f prime of p divided by g prime of p. Okay, so this is, and so the map is indeed well defined. So we have a well defined map like that. And, you know, <coughs> what we also, uh, what I also claim is that this map is actually injective. 
Okay? So if we know what the function associated, so the map p goes to this, uh, p goes to h of p is, we know what h was as an element in this ring. Okay? So this map is injective. So the map which sends h in OV of u to the map to the thing which I called also h, you know, later we won't want to identify them, which sends, so the map which sends p to h of p from u to k. So this map is injective. So why is that? So we have to see. Um, how is it? So we take another element, h prime, in OV of u, such that um, h of p is equal to h prime of p for all p in mu. We have to see that uh, h is equal to h prime as elements in this ring. So as elements in the fraction field of, of AV. Well, so let's see. So in other words, this means that um, h, if I take h minus h prime of p, so I, I put, so yeah, h, if I put l equal to h minus h prime, okay, this is now as elements here, you know, this is a ring homomorphism, so then this says, uh, then l of p is equal to zero for all p in u. And we want to so say that L is actually zero. Well, we write L to F divided by G. Where F and G elements in whatever AX or AV, maybe I write AX. And um, G is not zero. So this means G is not the zero element in AX. Not that G is everywhere non-zero, but G is not the zero element. Okay. But if G is non-zero, then this means that, you know, you know, there's the zero set of G is a closed subset of X. So, so let uh, W be equal to U intersected, uh, no, minus the zero set of G. This is a non-empty open subset of u. And we know it's non-empty because if the thing is not zero, there will be some open subset where it's not zero. And this means that w is the intersection of u with another open subset. If it's irreducible, it's easy. Being irreducible is equivalent to saying that the intersection of any non-empty open subsets is open. So this was maybe not stated explicitly. So if um, um, the x is irreducible and u and v are non-empty open subsets, then 
then it follows that u intersected v is non-empty. This is actually uh, a restatement of the uh, of being irreducible. I think it's more or less uh, if you place the closed subsets by their complements, then you get you know, in the definition of irreducible, you have some some statement about uh, closed subsets, and if you take their complements, which are open, you get this statement. Okay, <clears throat> so this is a non-empty open subset. And so, um, so thus for P in W, we have that, uh, that zero, that uh, if I take F of P divided by G of P, which after all is just L of P, but here I can just take this F and G because the G is, doesn't vanish there. is equal to f of p divided by g of p. So g of p is non-zero, so that means that f of p is zero for all p and v. In w. So that means that f lies in the ideal of w which is the same as the ideal of x. Well, no, I mean, let me see it differently. You know, we have seen that, so, f is an element in ax. We know that the zero set of an element of ax is closed. So, that means f is zero on a closed subset which contains this open subset w. But the closure of w is the whole of x. So, that means f is is zero. So as the zero set of F is closed, it follows that F is equal to zero. And so therefore, by definition, L, which is F divided by G, is equal to zero. This is the zero element in Kx. So we see that indeed um, we have, a, have an injective ring homomorphism here. So we can therefore say that OV of U is embedded as a subring of this. So if we want, we can identify OV of U with, a, with its image which will be a certain uh, ring of functions from u to k. And one can work out which ring it is. I mean, the map is obviously not subjective. Um, so, So we can, so exercise, or maybe, yeah. So the result will be that OV of U, or rather its image in the set of functions from U to K, Uh, is the set of functions from u to k which locally are given as quotients of, of polynomials.
in k. We are, after all, we have an affine right in k x1 to xn. So how does it look precisely? So the precise statement is the following, and I call it an exercise. It just is an exercise, in just you know, unraveling the definitions. You know, you have to kind of remember what uh, AX was, and then put this in the definition there. there. And so you you just put it together, and you find so um, so this image. So. Well, I mean, I just say now the image of, and uh, often we'll just identify it with O V of U, is the set of functions H from U to K, such that, and now we, you know, you know, Every point has a neighborhood such that uh, in that neighborhood uh, it is a quotient of two polynomials, such that the denominator does not vanish there. So, set of functions such that uh, for all points P in U, there exists. Um, Oh boy, an open neighborhood W of P and U and functions and polynomials um, F and G. such that uh, G is nowhere zero on W. So G of, P, G of Q is zero for, is non-zero for all Q in W. And um, uh, H of Q is equal to F of Q divided by G of Q for all Q in W. So in some sense, as I, <coughs> so again, it is not claimed that it will not be true in general that we can write H everywhere as quotient of F divided by G so that G is nowhere zero on W. This will usually not be possible, but we can for each point, find a neighborhood so that in that neighborhood it can be written like that. Okay. So, um, and I mean, this thing obviously, if you want to solve the exercise, just given we have, you know, we have this class H in the quotient field, in the field of rational functions, this can be written in several ways uh, as, as restrictions of polynomials, as elements in as quotients of uh, uh, elements in AX. And uh, you can always, you know, for each point, you can choose one such that the denominator doesn't vanish at that point. And if it doesn't vanish at a point, it will also not vanish in some neighborhood of that point because the locus where it doesn't vanish is open. And so if you uh, write it down, you see that this is the statement we want to show. Anyway, it's quite trivial, but it is just, uh, we want to use in future both definitions. So we also want to, sometimes we want to view O V of U as a set of functions like that. And sometimes we want to view O V of U as a, as, you know, a sub uh, ring of the field of rational functions. And it's okay because we have a canonical isomorphism between these two rings. Ah, one more thing I had called, we had called um, 
uh, OV, OP, how was it, OVP, uh, the local ring of V at P. So um, there is actually a concept in, um, uh, in algebra of something being a local ring. And uh, so I want to tell you that the local ring of V at P is a local ring. Okay. So, um, so we have, um, so we have another thing. Uh, we can define something else. The maximal ideal, ideal at P is MP, which is defined to be all the elements um, F in the local ring, or maybe call them H, in the local ring at V of P, such that H of P is zero. Remember that we, you know, if, um, if it lies in local ring, we know what H of P is. You know, we write H as F divided by G, and it's F of P divided by G of P, and it makes sense to say that H of P is zero. So we have the functions which are zero there. <coughs> Um, and this is certainly, this is a maximal ideal. In OVP. Namely, uh, I mean, we have, and obviously we have the evaluation map. Homomorphism. Uh, whatever, from uh, this local ring to K, which sends uh, H to H of P. This is obviously a surjective ring homomorphism. And obviously the kernel, by definition, is M of P. And so that means that uh, you know, MP is, um, uh, is, a, is a maximal ideal because it's the kernel of a subjective ring homomorphism to a field. No, I mean, a ring is a maximal, I mean, a subring, or an ideal is a maximal ideal if it's uh, the kernel of a map to field, or equivalently, if the quotient by it is a field. Okay, and so this is a maximal ideal, and we have something. It's however somewhat the situation is much more special. If we take it somehow the unique maximal ideal in this ring in a very strong sense. So, if we have an element H in uh, this local ring, which does not lie in the maximal ideal, then this means then we can write uh, H equal to F divided by G, where F of P, where, where first G of P is non-zero, because that means that it lies in the local ring. But you know the result H of P is F of P divided by G of P, so we also have that f of p is non-zero. So therefore, if we take 1 over h, which is a g divided by f, this is also an element in the local ring. No? So thus, it follows that h is a unit. So obviously, a unit can never be an element of any non-trivial ideal. If you have an ideal which contains a unit, it's the whole ring. So there, here we are in this special situation that we have a maximal ideal which contains all non-units. So it's as big as an ideal can possibly be. Yeah, yes? Maybe. What? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, that uh, I said it, but I didn't write it, yeah. So. 
So, uh, okay. So we see that uh, uh, MP is a maximal ideal containing all non-units. And so um, this is the property of a local ring. So a ring is called local if it uh, contains a maximal ideal if you want unique, but that obviously follows, maximal ideal which consists of all non, you know, of all non-units. So, uh, such that M, such that R without M is equal to the units in R. So we have kind of an ideal which is really maximal in the most maximal sense. And so this is called a local ring. And so uh, in commutative algebra, people often study local ring. But in some sense, it actually is the other way around. <coughs> so in algebraic geometry, people have introduced these local rings. And their main property is this one. And then people in commutative algebra study, uh, you know, study rings which look like uh, the local ring of a, uh, of a variety and call them local rings. But anyway, uh, whatever it is, <coughs> the local ring of a variety is a local ring. Okay, so enough of that. Uh, now we want to um, finally see. Now we want to study the uh, regular functions on an affine variety. And in fact, we want to study the regular functions which are regular everywhere on an affine variety. So according to this, uh, uh, our definition, if x is an affine variety, then here we have Ox of x, which is the, regular, the functions on x which are regular on the whole of x. Okay, so we want to study those, and the claim is that those are actually just the polynomial functions. So if we require that on an affine variety, uh, uh, the you know we have a function which has nowhere a pole, which is everywhere defined, then it actually is a, the restriction of a polynomial. That's. Um, so, on an fine variety, so uh, x functions which are regular everywhere um, are uh, polynomial functions. So I should, just to be sure, we should recall that Ax, so the uh, uh, coordinate ring of x, uh, you know, can be viewed or be identified with the subring of uh, the field of rational functions by just taking the rational functions where the denominator is 1. You know? So can be, is canonically identified with the set of all f divided by 1, such that f is an element in Ax as a subring of Kx. So this is, leads to the statement that if you have a, an integral domain, it's always a subring of a field in this way. Okay. <clears throat> and now we want to come to this. So the statement is uh, let so proposition 
let x be any fine variety then O x of x is equal to A x. Okay, so let's see. This is actually not, if you think of it, this is not so, it doesn't look so very trivial because it, <coughs> it a little bit contradicts some of the things that I warned you about before. You know, an element in O x of x is a is something which I can write so that for every point in x I can find two polynomials uh, or can find two uh, regular functions so that I can write it as a quotient of two, these two regular functions so that the denominator is not zero at that point. But for different points I might to have to use different denominators, different such representations. But the claim is here that I can find one which is nowhere zero. In fact, I can take it to be a constant. And so one has to see how that would be the case. So let's look at the proof. So obviously, we have that O of x of x, uh, that Ax is contained in O x of x. Now, an element in Ax can be viewed as f divided by 1, and this is certainly a quotient of two polynomials so that the denominator does not vanish anywhere. So that's fine. So we have to show the other conclusion. So, well, let's see. So we take an element h in O x of x. So then uh, we go by the definition. So if we fix any p in x, then it follows there exists polynomials, say I call them f of p and g of p. Uh, so we assume here maybe that x is a closed subvariety of a n, also to fix notation, um, in k x1 to xn, um, such that Well, that the class of this thing, which is uh, an element in Ax, uh, so if I take f divide p divided by g of p, this is an element in Ox of x, a quotient of two elements in Ax, that this is equal to h, but also that g of gp of p is non-zero. Okay. So we can write it as a, the quotient of the classes of polynomials, which just means the same as the quotients of elements in Ax, such that at p it is non-zero. And we can find such a representation for every p. And we want to somehow find a representation which, is, which works for all p at the same time. In fact, the denominator should not be one. Should not be, should have degree zero. <laughs> okay. So we can also say it like this. Maybe I forget about this p. So for so equivalently, for all p in X, there exists a, a polynomial G uh, 
which here was called GP, but anyway, we don't really need it, uh, such that uh, if I take H times the class of G, this is an element in A of X. Because, you know, if I take, so maybe I do write here GP. In this notation before, you know, it's just, if I take H and multiply it by GP, I get FP. Okay, so we have this wonderful statement. Well, so, um, we use this to write down some idea of which we want to show that it actually is the whole ring. Namely, let J be the set of all polynomials G such that if I take H times the class of G, this is an element in AX. Okay. So J is an ideal. Because if I take H by G1, I get some element in A of X. If I take H times G2, I get an element in A of X. So if I take <coughs> um, what, where? No, N, in. I hope very strongly I said in, but I wrote equal. So this is an idea. This is kind of obvious, no? If H times G1 is an element A in AX, and H times G2 is an element B in AX, then H times G1 times G2 plus G2 is A plus B, and so on with the product. Uh, with the, okay, so this is an ideal. And furthermore, and J contains the ideal of X. Because if I have an element in the ideal of X, uh, this class is zero, and so I get zero, and that's certainly an E of X. Okay, so this is an ideal which contains the ideal of X. And we can look at something else. What is the zero set? What is the zero set of J? So let's say we look at the um, zero set of J intersected with X. What is it? This is a set of all points such that, uh, all points in X, such that if I have an element here with this property, then this element has to vanish at that point. Okay? But we have seen here that this is precisely uh, not the case. We know that for every point in X, there exists a polynomial, such that if I multiply with the class of the polynomial, we are here, and g of p is non-zero. So we see that this is the empty set. Okay. On the other hand, we have that j contains i of x. So that means, so j contains i of x. This means that the zero set of j is contained in x. No? So if then the intersection, you know, so that means the intersection of C of J with X is just C of J. So it follows that Z of J is the empty set. And now we should remember, uh, you know, the whole point of introducing this uh, strange ideal is that now we are in a situation to use the Nullstellensatz. Now remember we had the statement of the Nullstellensatz that if we have an ideal with the property that its zero set is the empty set, then this ideal contains the element one. Okay? So by the Nullstellensatz, you have that one is an element in J. Um, and so what this means is that if I take, you know, what is, 
what is J is a set of all polynomials so that if I multiply by its class, I get into AX. So we have that H times 1, which is just H, is an element in AX. So, <clears throat> but you can see that in some sense, I mean, the proof is not now so very complicated, but in some sense, you see it's a very deep result because we actually have to use this Nullstellensatz, which uh, requires a very long proof. No, because uh, so to go from this fact that you locally have this everywhere to the fact that you actually can choose the denominator to be one actually requires uh, some reasonably big gun. So, <clears throat> okay. So this was this statement. Now I have. So we will. <clears throat> so we somehow see that. Um, uh, you know, in some sense, that's also maybe what we wanted. We wanted that these regular functions somehow generalize uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the polynomial functions on affine varieties. So, so on affine varieties, we would want to get back the polynomial functions. We want to get more functions on smaller sets, but we want this to be just this. Okay, so this was it for the, um, so these are the regular functions on uh, projective algebraic sets. Now, I, uh, on a fine algebraic sets, now we want to go to projective varieties. And here, we somehow can see that this thing of having to take these quotients of polynomials is, uh, you know, much more evident. Because if we take a polynomial and take a restriction of a polynomial to a projective variety, this is not a function. Because, you know, if you multiply the coordinates, you know, the, an element in the projective space is a, an n plus 1 tuple of, uh, of elements in K up to a multiplying by a constant. If I multiply by a constant and I put it into a polynomial, I get something different. So polynomials never define uh, functions on projective or quasi-projective varieties. So we have to anyway use something else than polynomials. But what will turn out is that if we take um, quotients of homogeneous polynomials of the same degree, then they define functions. Okay. So, um, so if x is projective variety or quasi-projective variety, um, x in Pn, then elements of polynomials f in K x0 to xn will not define functions um, I mean just nowhere on, on no open set uh, of uh, x so x to k but we can take Uh, quotients of homogeneous polynomials of the same degree. Quotients um, f divided by g of homogeneous polynomials of the same degree. So we will want to do this in a moment. So, <clears throat> yeah. 
So we, um, and we can again, instead of looking at the polynomials, we can look at the uh, at elements in uh, k x0 to xn divided by the homogeneous ideal of x. So definition, so we look at the generalization of the coordinate ring. So let x subset pn be a projective algebraic set. So it also works for projective algebraic sets. Uh, the homogeneous coordinate ring of X so I denoted by is by SX so this is defined to be just all the polynomials divided by the homogeneous ideal of x. Okay. So this is something that we can define, but we have to remember that elements of Sx do not define functions on x. They only would if polynomials would define functions on x, but they don't. But um, you know, we can again look at the quotient field of this thing. And inside these quotient fields, we look just at the elements which are quotients of homogeneous polynomials of the same degree. Okay, but maybe I can first say, so again, S of X is an integral domain. So we can form, we have uh, Q of X, Q of S of X is its quotient field. And uh, maybe I state again what I just said. So we have that elements of SX do not define functions x to k. But if um, um, h is equal to f divided by g, where f and g are homogeneous polynomials So either homogeneous polynomials or classes of of the same degree. Say D. So what then? Then if I take any point, if g of p is non-zero, so p is equal to a0 to a n, um, in pn. So if g of p is non-zero, I can put uh, h of p to be f of p divided by g of p. And notice that if I write it out, if I take another representative uh, of uh, p, we have that f of a0 to a n divided by g of a0 to a n. On the one side, we can also look at an other representative, so f of um, lambda a0 to lambda a n divided by g of lambda a0 to lambda a n. Well, you know, 
I know that you know, if, it's, if it's homogeneous of degree d, this is equal to lambda to the d times f of this. This is equal to lambda to the d like this. So I can write this is equal to this, lambda to the d divided by lambda to the d. And so they are equal. So this cancels. So we see that the, so h of p is independent of the representative. It's well defined. This is well defined. Okay. So what time? Ah, time is already up. So, yeah, maybe it is, let me see. Yeah, maybe it's not uh, good to seriously go into this now. So I will uh, next time do the proper, uh, I mean, finish the definition correctly and then uh, <clears throat> so it's kind of clear that uh, we do the same thing in our regular functions will be uh, on an open subset will be so will be elements in the in the quotient field of sx which however can be written as quotients of homogeneous polynomials of the same degree such that the denominator doesn't vanish uh, at a given point p and then for all p in open set u. And then with these things, we can work in precisely the same way as uh, in the affine case. And uh, <clears throat> so we will develop this, and then we'll see that this actually allows us uh, to say that uh, this is, well, anyway, then we will use this to define morphisms. <coughs> So morphisms will be uh, continuous maps between such varieties which are compatible with these uh, regular functions. And we will find that this tells us that, uh, for instance, this map from An into Pn, which we had used to identify An with an open subset of Pn, actually turns out to be a morphism. And it really embeds An as an open subset of Pn. And uh, anyway, and then uh, so that after that somehow the, it gets unified again. So there's no diff. We really have to look only at quasi-projective varieties because whatever we have done in the case of An is a special case of what we do for Pn. Well, okay, maybe that's uh, as much as we hope to do next time.